Maar het is altijd tip voordat je presentatie geeft, al je zakken leeg maken. Ja, het is een beetje Ja, dus nu is alles leeg. Musical ken je toevallig? Ja. Hij staat nu open. Ja, ik heb deze tijd ook. Ga ik je niks wijs maken? Uh, de handheld niet gewoon. Uh, nee. nee, ik herhaal de vragen toch. Dat maakt niet uit. Dan uh, wens ik je veel plezier als je ja? dit gaat doen. Ja, ik hoop het. Net deed hij het met allemaal, dus uh, ja, misschien dat hij niet crasht en dan is het weer klaar. Ik krijg gelukkig dat ik het helemaal zelf oplossen. Ja, mist hij wel. Nee. Nee. Nee, dat is gewoon even het latency, denk ik. En dan komt die. Kijk. There we are. 100 miljoen miljard. Ik wil het zeggen, dat is een druk programma. Waarschijnlijk heb je thuis iets meer schermen dan. Ja. Yeah. <laughs> ik kan het zeggen. Yeah. Uh, dit is resolutie.
VoIP services and other omni-channel channels. I mean, that's easy because they're already there. I trust them and I can just visit the conference, get to know the people, and from there I'm built. But the main challenge is to find those undefined ones. In our button. And uh, you can find my stuff for contacting, LibyDean, Twitter, and uh, Drupal.org. I changed recently my user profile name from some iDevit to Flores G, so people can actually find me on Drupal.org. And it used to be a hustle where you break all your commit rights and code and whatnot, but they fixed it. So if you want to change your identity on Drupal.org, you can just do so these days. All right. So let's go into Zero Trust Drupal. Uh, we cover today what it is, uh, what kind of architecture that I'm fond of, being completely open source to play around with. And uh, yeah, from there you can also start doing that. Um, a little bit more insight on cloud. Uh, everybody's working in the cloud, everybody's talking about the cloud, but what is it actually? And how, what understanding do you need in order to further understand the implications that a zero trust model might have on your infrastructure, on your processes, and in your whole way of working. Um, so we take the control with only open source tools and then uh, go to the essence, uh, the one that's usually forgotten about controlling the network, who has access to what, which services are running or not, and uh, from there on, there is only one last obstacle to, to cope with, that is social engineering. Uh, who here knows what social engineering is? Social engineering is befriending someone and thus finding out, out of context, normal conversations, what their key statement words are that might be used for passwords or other means of entry. So, what is zero trust? This is a gimmick. Uh, Cartoon. It's actually true and not true at the same time. Uh, so yeah, we have implemented zero trust. Oh great, great. I don't believe you. Ah, there's the key. And then exactly, we don't believe you. So uh, let's jump to this one. Yeah, I'm skipping one. No. Uh, if we look at top 50, who here knows CVE? CVE.org is a website where you can find all kinds of exploits. Not just in a Drupal or another big CMS or another software or within a company, also within your specific libraries. Meaning that every time you do a compose a require, it will take a bunch of libraries. And those can also have security implications. And if you then make a nice uh, Node.js based next or whatever front end with every Angular or React, your stack of dependencies will grow by heaps. So if you are looking for uh, securing your software, start here, look into it. And if we look at the top 50, I specifically chose the top 50 because Drupal is, is exactly at number 50 if you keep their order. I changed the order a little bit. Uh, so we have here like the, the severity of the, these three are important. Uh, if, if things get red in Drupal.org, you're in this corner. So this one is yellow, green, very good. So I sorted by the last three columns of severity. So the most impact that this hack or exploit has is at the top. So obviously Microsoft, Google, and uh, Apple are leading this because they have a bunch of software. And they have active teams that are continuously finding these issues, patching them, sharing them, etc. Uh, in the middle parts, it gets a little bit shady around the, the novel and the, the semantics and all these other companies that might still do a great job of opening up and sharing the issues with the world. But in general, you see the tendency that there is uh, security by obscurity, meaning that if you don't tell anybody, you don't have any problem. That kind of problem. So somewhere at the end, uh, under just under FFmpeg, we find uh, PHP, and just under there, obviously, since we are at a Drupal conference, I grouped the open source CMSs, where currently this uh, Drupal is uh, place number 50, and in my list it comes three before the end, because I was filtering on severity. So, as a Drupal, we're doing it much better than the WordPress and Joomla or uh, Moodle or other kinds of PHP-based CMSs. Oh, great. Why? Why 
why we're doing so well in Drupal. That is due to the fact that we have 1,500, 1,500 people from our community who are actually involved within the Drupal.org security team. And they are reading through this code, seeing issues, reporting issues, and collaborating. And that's why, as a community, we can be just as effective in, in getting things more secure than the companies are doing and can. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. So now we come down to the zero trust. Uh, in general, you have from origins um, the, the castle and the moat security model, meaning that you build a huge fortress and you do that around your on premise demilitarized zone. And in there, you have really strong firewalls, you have VPN, and great, that's it, I'm safe. I can now have my company working with all their data without any risk. No, that ain't gonna work. What if one of your employees or one of your colleagues wants to do wrongdoing? They can just do so because the exterior is secure, but the interior is not. Another thing, what if somebody puts a silly USB stick into their laptop? If it fits, because these days the USB gets smaller and smaller, maybe it doesn't fit. But if it fits, the computer is already compromised and it's being part of your network. Fully open. So this model is changing. Uh, obviously, there's little red guys around that are trying to attack it from the exterior, and this whole, whole model is built and thought up to only think that threats and uh, issues are coming from the external to the internal. But they're not. They're coming from everywhere. And everything that you can check and can control, you should control and should check. So what is it about then? It's mostly about identity. I'm an identity, I'm first. Uh, my computer is an identity. It has a, a way of connecting over the network, and it authenticates with that, uh, my login credentials. It has got an IP number from the Wi-Fi port based upon randomness and my uh, network address of my adapter. So this is all kinds of identities. And having these identities, um, well, the access to that uh, secured and controlled, um, makes a perfect first step on controlling the rest of uh, the whole ecosystem. So, how about cloud? What is cloud? Well, I would say there is no cloud. There is just somebody else's computer that you are actually renting, bought, or uh, some VMware, or Kubernetes, or Docker, or whatnot kind of a cluster. It can be Google, it can be Azure, it can be anything. One thing for sure, you don't own it. It's not yours. You're renting it. So you don't know who has actually access to your stuff. There must be an engineer that takes care of this Google Cloud. And we've seen it recently with leaked passwords and leaked uh, credentials that other people that are not so good willing as this one uh, Google Cloud engineer also get access to your stuff. So, the main purpose here with cloud is, yeah, it is there. We used to sell it like VMware virtual machine where you can have your online box, and now we sell it as cloud. Perfect, sounds great, but I still don't trust any of that stuff. Nah. So what kind of clouds is there? We have three kinds of clouds. Um, let's start with the most easy one. Uh, that used to be the on-premise um, data room with the demilitarized zone where you run your machines, that's your private cloud. So you buy or rent a piece of infrastructure and it's only dedicated for you, your product. Maybe your company or a collection of individuals or companies that work together within that space. Then we have the public cloud, the public cloud is shared. We have them in flavors like uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, uh, this, uh, this uh, AWS, but also OVH and other uh, European cloud vendors are around. We should always name at least four. Because I'm making commercial and not open source things. So, zooming into the main difference between public and private cloud, uh, public cloud, like I just said, is shared. So, yeah, people could buy, pass by, sniff your network, find stuff out, which is happening. And it supports multiple customers into one tier, and on the other hand, the private one is only serving your stuff. Um, it's virtual, 
supports internet connectivity and in main, most of the private clouds you first have to make a specific connection either by SSH, VPN or another means of logging in, identifying and then you get access to your stuff. Cool. Okay. Uh, so public is suited for scaling up, having public access, things are like that are like common. For example, a website, the content you show on your website is not secret at all. You want people to access that and follow up and become your client. It's all perfect there. And uh, for private, it's more suited for confidential information. But still, keep in the back of your mind, you do need to know who has access to what. So, what are the infrastructure that you're renting out? Uh, what, what are you building on? What software are you using? What CVE exploits are in there? Etc. 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 Which might make this a little bit more complex than I'll show you now. So, then there's two kinds of services. Uh, we have a stateful service and we have a stateless service. Let's start off with the stateless service. Uh, that is something that does not contain a database or a hash. And uh, that is something that is uh, frequently asked, uh, accessed by uh, metadata. And uh, it doesn't really matter if you have one instance or a billion instances, it is made to auto scale. So if you need more power, more delivery, you just kill more instances and more services spin up and they share and spread out the same data and the same information. And if one node is killed, no problem, because the other nodes will take over uh, due to fail over and load balancing. Uh, that's great. Uh, very suitable for swarming, scaling, Kubernetes kind of deployments. And on the other hand, we have stateful. Stateful, that is everything that has a database or a cache. And it can be uh, custom apps that have large amounts of data. And it, if a node is broken and you don't have a direct fallover, your system is broken and it doesn't work anymore. In general, for building this and playing with this, we use a very easy open source tool, which is called Proxmox. The link is in the bottom right, just under the little camera thingy. But there's no issue because these slides obviously will come on the Drupal, uh, the Drupal Jam site, so you can there click on it and find out about this great open source tool. It has two kinds of, uh, well, let's say containers. You have the LXC Linux containers. Uh, I use that for everything that doesn't need a kernel patch, uh, that doesn't need to have a difficult network stack, like Kubernetes does, or my network. And if it does, then I put that stuff inside a virtual machine. And it works on the QAML basis, which is like a Linux virtualization. Then, so what can we actually trust? Can I trust the bare metal that I get at Hersey? No, no, I cannot. For there is, uh, in the boot rooms and the firmwares, there is still uh, backdoors available that have been put there by the vendor. So the only way that I can make bare metal fully secure is if I own it and I flash it, I change the boot room, I violate the warranty, and then I could say, okay, I can trust this machine for sure. Same thing for, for this beautiful shiny thing that I buy at Apple. I don't know who, whoever has a backdoor in there. Apple guarantees me that it doesn't, but I don't know. I don't know. And then how about virtualization? What if I go to VMware and say, oh, give me a VMware cluster, they will make me sign a contract and have everything ensured, but still there is engineers that have access to that whether I like it or not. So, what to do that? How can we make this thing in a way that I can fully control everything? That's my purpose. So then we could look at this one. This is an interesting one. Uh, this is the DevOps periodic table. <laughs> uh, the same way you have in chemistry, and it consists of, uh, well, not a bazillion, but really a lot of different kinds of infrastructure builders, uh, testing, integration, you know, this guy Travis maybe, or you know, uh, GitLab is on there, or you know, some other tools. And no, I did not check and test them all. Uh, mainly what I did here is, uh, what is these kinds of tools that I might actually need? Uh, you need something to automate that it comes in the same state, 
whenever you run a pipeline, you need something to monitor and audit, you need something to uh, have access. I am servers or some other servers that I know, okay, this person is trustworthy and should belong to that database. They can do their work. <coughs> so from there, there is like some kind of a favorite stack, which is mine. It starts off with this. Uh, who here knows something about Ansible? Ansible is, I'm going to say, a scripting language. It's a way of consistently uh, installing and configuring any application by heart. So in this example, it is like the, the pizza guy. You know, I'm making pizzas and I'm selling pizzas. So this is the imagery that I use for. Uh, business people uh, just expect everything next to a pizza. They might understand what is actually needed. So with Ansible, you can just do like everything. It's like this one I stole from Mr. Red Hat, and here is Red Hat. It's copyrighted. Uh, but for example, if you go online and check uh, a guy named Jeff Deering out, he has great Ansible movies, and he has a train or a deployment suite to install a new Mac OS with everything that he uses by Ansible. So he doesn't even touch the machine. It will just go automatically and provision that. And what we do with this Ansible, we have this kind of a recipes for every app, for every subsystem. For example, you have a Drupal with a MariaDB and uh, some Redis caching. And what else you need? Ah, oh, PHP. And PHP 8, point one. And because Drupal 9 now runs on PHP 8.1, then you trigger this recipe and say, I want this, this, and this, and to go in that box, and then it does its magic, you see, and done. Five minutes later, you have a consistent install. That's why you use Ansible, is to have consistency. And in my example, I use Debian based, but if you want to have a Red Hat based, or FreeBSD, or Arch Linux, it doesn't matter, you just update the meta of the script to adjust for the differentiation that there is between those operating systems. Another thing that we use there is Terraform. It's like making the pizza boxes and having them look here. So what Terraform can do is make consistent infrastructure as code. Meaning that you write a new box with four cores and uh, 120 gigabytes of memory because it has databases and stuff. Some search and Terraform will find out, oh, okay, we're now in Azure, so I need to have this module and this stuff to make the same thing. And if you're in other cloud provider, it will do the same thing, exactly the same thing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have these, I've seen that in AWS that you have these little boxes and you explain, I don't know what it means. It's so complex, so many different items. And if you change to another vendor, you get the same stuff with different names and different items. So in order to cope with that and have consistent, exactly the same uh, infrastructure, you use Terraform. So with these two things, the boxes are there. They are consistent, but nothing is secure yet. There is no actual keeping of secrecy. And there's also no standardization upon the base OSs. So for the base OSs, what we would use is Docker. You can also use uh, Helm charts or other kinds of uh, consistent image builders uh, in order to have your foundation. Uh, in my case, that is uh, Ubuntu 20.04 or Debian 10, because I like to work with that. But it could be anything you like to work with. Uh, but at least you have those consistent as well. So then we go to the secrets. And for secrets, there is a nice application which is also fully open source, which is called HashiCorp Vault. And uh, Vault is beyond the key value store. With the key value store, you can do like uh, key and value, you can retrieve those. And in here, you can have um, better coverage of the secrets and who has access to what secrets. Uh, specifically, being used when APIs start to call each other, when APIs are touching on machines. And then again, it's a little dubious. You need more layers to get the humans because humans are the weakest links in, in this story, to have those also covered and have them get the secrets without that they actually need to see the secret. Because that is where it goes wrong. Nine out of ten times is that people are sharing passwords. Usually they do that over the chat or WhatsApp or something 
paper. I don't know what people do. They, they share and the resource and process. Crazy. Because while doing so, who says that it doesn't get shared another time to anybody else? And even if the medium is somewhat secure and encrypted, who says that nobody else? Like we recently see with the European Union that has a new law for spying on us, and the Amer Americans already do this the whole time. They call the NSA. They love to do that. So yeah, it is a start of a solution. So what does this vault actually do? Because I just said it's beyond a key value store, and it has those secrets in here. Let's call them the values for now. And they're identified uh, along uh, which client has access. And then, uh, for about a year, one and a half, I'm not sure exactly, uh, there is authentication on top of that. So you can use this vault and authenticate, authenticate against another provider. This might be your corporate LDAP, this might be your Google that everybody's fancy about. It can be something that you own yourself. Uh, for example, Keycloak, very beautiful open source software with whom you can do I am Active Directory, OpenID Connect, everything. All these things are already in the box for free. So I take that if you have the choice. If you don't have a choice and you need to integrate with Azure or AWS, you can just do that out of the box with a single click. So now we've got secrets covered, we've got um, infrastructure a little bit covered. What is missing? The network. The network is always missing. Um, most benefits are taken by just getting a packet capture device, put it on the network, sit down, have a beer, and wait. And then you see a lot of interesting stuff going by. Not just whose Facebook page are visited by who, but also that there is a lot of uh, credentials, text, plain text passwords, and other stuff that you really don't want uh, to, to share at all. Uh, let alone flow around your network where somebody can just sniff. One could say, okay, but I have SSL encryption, is that enough? No, 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 it's not enough. You can just sit in the middle of a proxy and mimic that you have the same little lock in the corner and sniff out all the information and yeah, there you go, no problem. So there's another um, tool, uh, this one is called Conzo, it's also by HashiCorp. I should not have started to work for Rocket, I should start to work for uh, HashiCorp, anyway. Uh, <laughs> what it does is actually make for every connection between apps or people uh, a secure SSL tunnel between the app itself. So instead of when a new engineer comes in, he gets an SSH login, the SSH login, oh no, I give him access to the whole intranet, the whole private network. People can snoop around there and maybe join their servers where they're actually supposed to work and do their work. Instead of doing that, console is as a flipped architecture. So you have, uh, for example, uh, Laurie is doing the database engineering, meaning that he goes in the database group and he gets access to the database. And that's it. And the software will find out where you came from, how you got access. It's just simple one password, but underwater, what the thing is doing is exchanging the certificates, asking uh, the, the, the back end what kind of access does the person have, and then magically makes the routes through the interwebs to the place where the person is actually supposed to do the stuff. Perfect. That's good. That's good. So what can it also do? It can do uh, service discovery. So in case of the example with the Kubernetes cluster, we throw 10 more nodes. The 10 more nodes already know from the recipes to which do I belong, what kind of application am I, and who has access. Perfect. So that means you can do uh, multi-cloud service meshes that you not only have your stuff here on premises, but also a little bit in Google, a little bit in Azure, and a little bit in OVH, and it's still able to find itself, find each other, and uh, share the network and make the network work. So with that you can do a network infrastructure automation. How does that look? We have here the console, we have here a little cluster of applications, and it just goes dynamically. You can just scale it and uh, go on with it. Easy.
then that thing can be either something bare metal, a virtual machine, a container, it can be serverless, that kind of uh, lambda functions where you throw stuff at a, uh, a service and you get an answer. And it can be behind firewalls, it can collaborate with load balancers and all that stuff that we have, including service and support channels. Well, sounds like a good plan. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. <laughs> this is another example. A um, little bit lives in Microsoft, a little, little bit lives in AWS, and it still works by uh, Federation Network Discovery. So what else? What else is needed there? One thing I'd like to add to everything is uh, MinIO storage buckets. Uh, who here knows MinIO? A few people. Uh, that's the same thing that you can buy at AWS. It's called an S3 bucket. More people know about this, probably, yes. But then it's for free. So you can self-host it, and you can put it in the data center, and it can federate. Meaning that I have this bucket connected to my in Drupal site's default files, and my users update their stuff. Meanwhile, somebody spins up another, and uh, whatever, Kubernetes with the same site. That is linked, and the Minio will find out, ah, I've got some Minio friends in that data center, share the data, and make the backups, and uh, these whole files are, are covered in there. Uh, the cool thing about Minio is that it has everything encrypted out of the box, so if you don't want to have stuff encrypted, you have to specifically set it so. And uh, yeah, it's a it's pretty robust way of, of actually having automated backups and spreading them around without losing your data. Another thing that could be added here is once you are actually sending messages, chat, is to look at interoperability and openness of communication protocols. Uh, most of you talk around, if you're back end or front end, you talk JSON. You talk JSON to the back end, the front end will render something, build something, the editor will type something, it will send the JSON back to the back end, and that will be stored. If these things get more complex, uh, it's good to look at standards, open standards. And one thing to highlight here is uh, the Matrix Federation Protocol, which is a beautiful standard that uh, yeah, allows for data objects to federate and spread out between services. And everything between those federated endpoints is, again, encrypted. That's something you need, again, not to lose stuff in your network. Then we're almost there. We're almost there. We covered uh, machine authentication authorization uh, by making consistent uh, Ansible. Then we have the uh, uh, machine to machine access that is being taken care of only in the network. So we fully control the network. We have it federated, we have it swarming, we have it working together. Next one, which is a new uh, product that is for human to machine access. And that's a new, it's also free and open source, also by HashiCorp. And it allows for uh, connecting to that Microsoft Active Directory. It allows for to this Google or to your own uh, home built uh, free path or another uh, open uh, access manager. And yeah, obviously that one is the family single sign on. And with the single sign on, we can take care of the last little hunk in this thing, which is the actual human. Because the machines are already know me. Machine, machine, you're still fine. So, that's in a nutshell what I wanted to say. I have a few add-ons. Uh, so maybe I'll first do the add-ons and then we jump to QA. Um, next, uh, not next week, in three weeks. The 25th of um, <coughs> June. We have on the beach in... Uh, uh, Zandvoort. Uh, we have a community event by the uh, Dutch uh, Drupal uh, Association, and uh, that is called uh, the Drupal uh, NL Community Picnic on the Beach. You don't need to bring your picnic basket. Everything is taken care of. We have a restaurant, we have food, we have drinks. So from about 11 in the morning to 5, 6, whatever you want, uh, you can come by, have fun, bring the kids, bring whoever you like that might be interested in 
having a social event. And another thing to highlight is that not just after this one, but after the next talk, at 5 p.m., we have the famous Drupal Jam pop quiz. And it's happening in a Duschmokal, uh, which is one to the left, yeah. And it's sponsored by the Media Moms. So this is about the slides that I have. Is there any questions that uh, I could take? How does, uh, for example, uh, project certification uh, come into play here? It, it, is there something like, I don't know, uh, a step CA uh, possibility to use that as secure tunnels that are secure from both ends instead of just from the web server side? Mm -hmm. okay. So the question is, how are client side certificates involved into this? group of Archicorp uh, applications and they belong here uh, and in the vault. Uh, specifically if you're talking about IAM access management, they're in that vault and if they're actually, uh, let's say, uh, the, it's, it's not called master uh, certificate, the, the root certificate from where the sub-certificates are derived those should go into the vault. Yeah, yeah, and there's no specific crypto hardware advice when you take it out of the vault that you want to process it and make it. So you either do that in some dedicated, uh, untemperable hardware if you're really seriously, or you do it in some machine with high entropy that doesn't have too much load. Because if you do it like that, it's pretty cheap and still. Well, secure enough for my opinion, let's say it like this. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Any other questions? Yes? I uh, would like to hear your personal opinion on two uh, ongoing uh, developments in this field, if uh, I may. Mm -hmm. Yes, perfect. Uh, and again, you said you didn't trust the, the Azure, the, the Google Cloud Platform, because you don't know who exactly has access to these machines. Uh, for example, current developments are with the AMD uh, server lineup that you have encrypted uh, RAM, mm -hmm. for example. And uh, the general trend seems to be that uh, the encryption goes uh, more and more towards the end of the line, so towards the, the end user. So um, so uh, the people that uh, have access to the machine have access to encrypted disks and encrypts, uh, encrypted uh, main memory. So it's uh, diff more difficult to uh, retrieve the data from the user if it's only uh, decrypted at, uh, when you take into account the network, network level. It's only decrypted at the end user's machine. So I would hear your uh, opinion about that yeah. development. It's, it's actually three questions into one. Yes, <laughs> no problem, no problem. I'll start from the first one. Yes. Uh, looking at memory encryption and disk encryption. Yes. Which is great if the machine is turned off. Because then I actually can assure that nobody has access to it. Mm -hmm. If the machine is on, the database is doing the disk encryption, meaning that the application just has access to the information. So it's not secure. It's not an actual uh, added barrier. If you have access to the application, you have access to the database. Same thing for the memory. Most of the issues arise when there is programming mistakes, which can be XSX escaped or some other means that you can actually access to the live app. If the live app is running, you can access the network, uh, sorry, you can access the memory and you can access the disk. So it's a beautiful technology from a technology point of view, adding value to the actual not trusting of everything. No. Not at all. And the second question on top of that, we were talking about, okay, this is around Azure and uh, Google and other clouds that I don't trust. Why do I don't trust them? Because I know that other people have access to them. And the second one, more important one, is what we share in Drupal, is that we share all the code. Meaning that everybody can do an audit on this code. Everybody can, if you can't do it yourself, you can ask a third party to do the audit and validate that this code is secure enough for you to use as your application. 
It happens in the Sclera French as well, with NDAs and uh, escrows and so forth. But in general, I don't have code to watch and see, hey, it's not good. I don't like this. Or I trust this code, I don't want to use it. And the third question, I already lost it. Can you repeat it? Uh, for me, it was just one question. Okay. <laughs> uh... No, because I was, I was sensing three topics with at least two questions on top of each other, and I'm not sure if it was a third on the hangar uh, there. Yes, but um, I have also another development yeah. coming into play in your answer uh, huh? as my follow up question. Of course. Um, there is also a development, uh, for example, by Purism that mm -hmm. uh, you can buy servers or uh, laptops, as uh, the one uh, that you have yourself, mm -hmm. with open source bootloaders, yeah. with uh, core boot, and you can also uh, sign off that bootloader. The bootloader can sign off the whole operating system, and then you have uh, a certified chain of trust for booting uh, into that and eventually uh, verifying it. Uh, your OS and your bootloader and your applications are all verified and uh, encrypted. How do you look at that? Uh, I think that's, that, that's uh, th those kinds of vendor-based open hardware encryptions is a beautiful technology. Yes. Uh, in that regard, it's running for a few years now, I think five or six, mm -hmm. maybe seven. Uh, there is core, uh, core boot, uh, ROM loaders. I've seen a very interesting um, the presentations at FOSDAM, so if you're interested in that stuff, look it up, FOSDAM, uh, open hardware stack. Uh, there is German cheaper vendors, because now I get the answer. Yes. The answer is cost for me. Uh, usually when I buy a pizza box, a physical <laughs> server, I spend 1200 euros. That's it. And getting this uh, signed off stuff, I won't get it for 1200 euros for a beefy machine. So for me it's a cost. Balance. Uh, if the client would say, no, I'm really, really done with this, I'm fully already working on my interoperability, my security, all my parts are in place, and I want to do something extra, I would gladly say, to them, yeah, yeah, take this stuff, because that is validated, signed off, and beautiful technology. Perfect. Cool. How are you doing? Uh, I think I, uh, on the understand what he was referring to. Um, he has a technology which uh, allows you to um, have uh, the memory encrypted mm -hmm. up into the process of Python. Mm -hmm. So the whole chain is encrypted, uh, and this is especially important in shared environments mm -hmm. where you can't trust that somebody else has access to your piece of memory. It comes back to the old school uh, story of the coprocessor. It does, in fact, the same thing. Your main processor is processing for your application, and you have your coprocessor where you can store some secrets or get some added value where it comes down to having encryption that is not accessible by the rest of your system. Yes. Uh, old thing, new jacket, beautiful technology, same answer. Yeah, but <coughs> yeah. that was the missing one. That was the missing one where I was mistaken that there was a third question involved. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Or remarks, if you have some idea or use case from your own life or, or whatever. No? Okay, then I go back to this slide. And thank you.
stimmt, wird dann 